Hello, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lapos of the House, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Tonight, we're going to look at the subject of spiritual warfare and specifically the armor of God. How do we put on the armor of God? What's that all about? So I'm going to ask Stephen to open up in prayer. Stephen, would you pray, please? Dear Father, precious Father, everlasting Father, thank you. Thank you for your presence among us, Father. You see, when two or three are gathered together in my name, they are my enemies. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Today, in our midst, to unveil the scriptures to us, that the eyes of our understanding be flooded with light. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Your word is bread to us, bread that satisfies our soul, our spirit, that strengthens us. Father, thank you. I pray that the word that has been taught today, Father, that it bless every one of us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Stephen. Okay, so we're talking about the armor of God, but before we do, we want to learn a little bit about spiritual warfare in general. So we're going to be showing you a short video on the subject, spiritual warfare. I hope it's a blessing to you, and I hope it builds a foundation in your heart for what is coming. So here we go with spiritual warfare. On the topic of spiritual warfare, a lot of Christians tend to be lackadaisical about the reality of spiritual battles. In one sermon by Priscilla Shire, she spoke on this matter. And she said, you have an enemy and he is scheming against you. He is against you. He is not for you. He plans to do anything and everything in his power to stir up challenges in your life. Enough to cause you to shrink back and not rise up and stand firm in the victory that you have been given in Christ Jesus. How true is this statement? Indeed, the devil is after us as children of God. And we need to be aware of this reality all the time. Because I don't know how you feel about it, but there are some battles that you face in life that may appear to be unexplainable. Battles and challenges that seemingly come out of nowhere and appear to not make any sense at all. But we need to remember that the Bible makes it clear that we ought to fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. It tells us further to walk by faith and not by sight. And furthermore, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The Bible tells us all of this because spiritual warfare is real. There is a real enemy who is really scheming against you. Here's what Priscilla Shire went on to say about the enemy we face. She said that we have an enemy who wants you to think that just because he is invisible, he is also fictional. He wants to be chalked up to nothing more than a caricature, a cartoon picture, a myth. He doesn't want you to recognize the influence that he has over your life, possibly to cause you to never walk in the full expression of God's grace and goodness in your life. He is sinister. He is a master illusionist and he is a deceiver and he hopes to cleverly disguise himself behind life's most pressing problems to where you will forget that he is even there. Now, I truly believe this to be true because the devil does disguise himself as he comes in many forms. He sometimes comes disguised as an angel of light. He comes disguised as a friend a friend who comes to trip you up in your faith. 
The devil even comes under the disguise of religion. But that is why we are told to test the spirits. And so when it comes to spiritual warfare, our best form of defense is not to run and hide. It's not to sit and wait it out. But rather, our best form of defense against the enemy is to put on the full armor of God. Because it's only when we put on the full armor of God, it's only then that we can stand and fight. The Bible speaks clearly about the reality of spiritual warfare. Now you can bury your head in the sand and pretend like this doesn't exist, but my friends, let me tell you that the Word of God would not mention spiritual warfare if it weren't a reality. But rather than focusing on the enemy we face, I want us to focus on the weapons that we've been given. Ephesians 6 verse 10 to 18 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. I want you to notice something. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, feet fitted with the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. These are all defensive elements for our armor. These are all meant to help us block the attacks of the enemy. They are designed to secure us and ensure that no weapon from the enemy's camp can cause serious damage to us. The only offensive weapon that we do have is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, a word that is living. This is what we are to defeat the enemy with. And so, I want you to understand each of these individual elements that make up our armor. Now, Jesus Christ said he is the one. Way, the truth, and the life. And we need to gird ourselves with this truth. The devil is the father of lies, but with the belt of truth on, we will not fall victim to the enemy's deception. We are to wear the breastplate of righteousness because it protects us from all of the enemy's unclean devices, his sinful schemes. With this on, we pursue righteousness and turn away from sin. On our feet, we are to be fitted with the gospel of peace. And I believe that this means we need to be rooted in God's gospel of Christ. And then there's the shield of faith. This is what protects us from the arrows that the enemy throws. Arrows of discouragement, arrows of depression, low self-esteem. Now your head is somewhere that your enemy will attempt to attack frequently because if he can affect you in your mind, he can affect your life, and so the helmet of salvation is a must for all believers. And finally, 
we are told to take up the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is God's Word. God's Word is living, and we can use His Word to defeat the enemy. We can speak God's Word over our lives for protection and safety. The Word of God is like a hammer that destroys evil. It crushes a person's unholy conscience because it is God's very own Word. You cannot deal with God and not change. You cannot meditate on the Word of God and not be changed. Romans 10.17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So the Word of God is like a hammer that helps to build faith. Another characteristic about the Word of God is that it is like a mirror. James 1 verse 23 says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. The word of God is like a mirror, and what does a mirror do? It allows one to see their blemishes and imperfections. The word of God shows us the true reflection of what we are to aspire to in terms of being Christ-like, and therefore we can see ourselves and see where we fall short in comparison to His Word. So will you make a choice today to meditate on the Word of the Lord? Will you make it a habit to meditate on the things of God? Okay, that's a great introduction to our topic. So let's begin. The armor of God, having seen the video on spiritual warfare. We're going to reread Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. So I'm going to read all through, and then we'll begin to break it down. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, you remember in the video, they were talking about some Christians not really being enthusiastic about spiritual warfare. It reminds me of the punching bag toy I had when I was a kid. You'll see it down here. I'll bring it up so you can see it. It was like a rubber clown, and you would hit the clown, and it would fall to the ground and rise back up again. The thing about the punching bag toy is that it stays still, it pops back up after you hit it, and it does not fight back. And it reminds me of the passiveness of so many Christians when it comes to spiritual warfare. So many Christians allow the enemy to hit them over and over and over again without really engaging him in the fight, without really getting involved in spiritual warfare. So they take it, they take it, they take it, they take it, they rise up, they take it, they rise up, they take it, they rise up, they take it, but they never fight back. Uh, here's some noise. Just give me a second for a, a minute here. Let me see. Ah, okay, I see where it's coming from. All right, let me go back to my notes. So they take a lot from the devil, but they don't fight back. And my purpose today is to get you to fight back. Now, what are some of the reasons why Christians do not engage in spiritual warfare? And let me just say that I'm guilty of every one of these, okay? <laughs> it's not like I'm pontificating today. I am guilty of everything I'm about to tell you. First of all, ignorance. Second Corinthians 2.11 says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So if you don't know your enemy, if you don't know his devices, 
If you don't know his strategies, you are an easy target for him and he will come after you and he will take advantage of you. A second reason why people don't involve themselves in spiritual warfare is passiveness. They're half-hearted in the battle. They don't press into prayer. They don't read the word. And they don't reveal their struggle to the body of Christ. They try to fight on their own in private, which is kind of a dumb thing to do when you have the resource of the body of Christ around you. And the body of Christ has tremendous authority in spiritual warfare. We depend a lot on other single individual Christians to come and deliver us if we turn to anybody at all. But really what we should do is turn to the body. A third reason why people don't involve themselves in spiritual warfare is listlessness. Listlessness. Beaten into submission and hoping things will just get better or go away just by hanging in there. So they don't really get involved. It's kind of lazy about it. It's too much trouble. They hope for a quick fix, not willing to put any investment in the presence of God, thinking that just saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus is enough and the devil will leave you alone. No, it's going to take a little bit more than that. So because spiritual warfare is draining and difficult and requires a tremendous amount of resolve to win the battle, sometimes it may take a long time to receive deliverance. Other times it may require a period of fasting because there's nothing quick or simple or easy about spiritual warfare, and it's much quicker if you rely on the body of Christ, people don't engage in it. So why is it so difficult? Why is spiritual warfare so hard? Because it's time-consuming, and it's inconvenient, and it's difficult, and it's straining. It's a war. I mean, let's face it, we are at war. Matthew 26, 40 to 43, Jesus says, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation, for the Spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. And I think that's a big reason why spiritual warfare is so difficult. Because in the spirit, we know that we need to do it. But in the flesh, we don't really feel like it because it's just too much trouble. It's too difficult. It's too painful. It's too engaging. But to be effective in spiritual warfare, we have to acknowledge that at least it's necessary and it's going to be a challenge to our, fre our flesh. Because otherwise, we will be sitting ducks for the enemy to flay, flay away against that will by doing literal nothing. So if we just stand there and do nothing, the devil's just going to pound us and pound us and pound us and hopefully try to take us out. So let's pick up our weapons and do something about what the enemy is trying to do against us. So now we're going to examine the armor of God and we're going to become familiar with our battle gear. But before we do that, we need to establish our authority. So in Luke 10, 19, Jesus talks about authority. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Take note of verse 20. So Lees, what gives us our authority? Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Okay, and uh, how does that give us authority? He died so that we can be healthy and free and live a victorious life and be saved. He died for all those things. That's right. So because our names are written in the book of life and we're citizens of heaven and we're blood-bought children of the living God, spirit-filled, that's how we get our authority. We get it directly from the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 54, 17 is very interesting because there the word of God says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That's where this verse comes from. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. So the righteousness of God in Christ is given to us and our heritage includes victory over the enemy. We're not supposed to be defeated by the devil. We're not supposed to lose in the battle. Second, let's make no mistake about the enemy's intentions. First Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may, may devour. Now, sober comes from the Greek word nephos, which means intox unintoxicated by the passions and desires of the old nature. You can be drunk on passions, drunk on lusts, drunk on desires, drunk on ungodly passions. And this tells us to be nephos, unintoxicated by the passions and desires of the old nature. Peter also tells us to be diligent, which means in Greek to be studious, to present yourself before God 
as one tried and true, an unashamed worker correctly handling the word of truth, which is from 2 Timothy verses four, or chapter 4, verse 9. In other words, be fully committed to the word and refuse to be lackadaisical. John 10.10 10 further outlines the intents of the devil. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and to destroy. I looked it up in the Greek, and it indeed says the thief, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And I have come that you may have life and have it in full. So, Steve, what does the enemy want to steal from you? The word of God that is sown in our heart. Like uh, 13, the Bible says, the sower went forth to sow. And as he sow, uh, some grain fell by the wayside. And the fowls of the air came and took those those seed that was sown. Ah, okay. So, so the, bir the birds of the air came to steal the word of God, the seed of the word. So the devil wants to steal the word of God out of our hearts. Is that it? Yes. Thank you. John, what does the enemy want to kill in us? Okay. The enemy wants to kill the peace, the peace of Christ. Okay. He wants to he wants to kill uh, our peace, yeah. and he he wants us to feel guilty. Okay, so he wants to steal our or kill our or kill our peace and make us feel guilty, condemned. Okay, that's good. And Oliver, what does the enemy want to destroy in us? What does the enemy destroy our faith? Destroy our faith. Oh, okay. Itzak, what does the enemy want to destroy in us? What else? Yes, that's uh, right. The faith, the message of gospel, the message of salvation. Okay. Jeffrey, what does the enemy want to steal and destroy in us? Well, what would you say? Yeah, the hope that we have in Christ. The hope that we have in Christ. And Lise, what would you say the devil wants to kill and destroy in us? Everything that we need to survive in this world, our finances, our relationships, our hope, our peace, our health. Yeah, and of course he was trying to... And he, our salvation. And he tries to get us to blame God for our, all of our troubles, which is one of his strategies. Okay. Yep. Well, we'll continue on. And now on to the armor of God. We're going to talk about putting on the armor first. Romans 13 verse 12 says, The night is far spent and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on, here it is, the armor of light. This is the only other place in the New Testament that talks about armor and putting on armor. But it reminds me of a passage from Ephesians chapter 5, which says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, here it comes, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, that all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. So we put on the armor of light in this practical way. We continue. Putting on the armor of light is to put on the Lord Jesus Christ or to walk in the Spirit. Colossians 3, verse 8 and up to 10 says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And then in Romans 13, 14, it says right after that, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh 
to fulfill its lust. So what do I get from this? Well, here's what I get. I get that walking in the spirit and denying the flesh is an essential part of spiritual warfare because it closes the door to the enemy's attacks. Walking in the spirit and denying the flesh is an essential part of spiritual warfare because it closes the door to the enemy's attacks. Galatians 5, verse 16 and 17. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, or wars against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. So what can we do to walk in the spirit? Stephen, what can we do to walk in the spirit? Walk in the spirit, you must be spiritually minded. The Bible says that uh, the carnal mind is enmity against God. To be spiritually minded is life. Uh, so we need to um, be spiritually minded, always looking at the word of God. Uh, uh, the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you are always mindful of the, of the things of the spirit, you will walk in the spirit. Okay, thank you. Lise, what do we do to walk in the spirit? Well, what I do is just, I'm just mindful of the Lord always being with me and praying in the spirit as much as possible, staying in communication. Okay. Itzhak, what do we do to walk in the spirit? First of all, we have to put armor on our body yep. and then to pray and uh, and uh, ask strength from the God so that we can walk in the spirit. Okay, thank you. Jeffrey, what do we do to walk in the spirit? We have to meditate on the word of God as to put the armor uh, sheet of faith uh, on to protect, us, to protect ourselves from the fiery darts of the enemy. Okay, thank you. Oliver, what do we do to walk in the spirit? Put on your microphone. Put on the armor of God. A similar, similarly, I would say to put on the armor of God and to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Okay. And John, what do we do to walk in the spirit? As far as you're I said the same thing. Pray with the, without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Yeah. And Lee's mentioned praying in the spirit, which I think is also very important. Yes. Because that's the one area where the enemy cannot interfere in. I was talking Sunday about going into the presence of God where the enemy cannot follow, but he cannot follow you when you pray in the spirit either because he has no idea what you're saying. So that's very important to have a weapon like that. And when you walk in the spirit... And I've said this on Sunday, I want to say it again now. When you walk in the Spirit, when you do everything necessary to walk in the Spirit, you have, as far as I'm concerned, already put on the armor of God. Now, some people find it necessary to actually pray for the Spirit to put on each piece one at a time, every day, or in the midst of a great challenge. For example, Lord, I put on the helmet of salvation. Lord, I put on the breastplate of righteousness. Whatever works for you is fine. If you want to do it that way, I have no objection whatsoever. But I want to point out that a superstitious application of the armor in the life of someone given over to the flesh, not walking in the spirit is a waste of time. So invoking the armor of God and not walking in the spirit is a complete waste of time because it is completely ineffective. So now we're going to break down Ephesians 6, 10 to 20, piece by piece, and try to understand it a little better. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or military strategies. This is what the wiles are of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Wrestling in this case brings up the image of Olympic wrestling. That's what Paul was thinking about. Two people grappling for an advantage, trying to pin one another. And that's what the devil's trying to do to you. He wants to pin you to the ground and take you out. So we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, human beings, people, but against principalities, and the Greek word for principalities is archons, which denotes empires, against powers, the Greek word for powers is exousion, or powers or generals, 
against rulers of darkness of this age, the Greek word is kosmokratoros, which is demons in control of worldly institutions, literally worlds, the art world, the sports world, the political world, the world of education, the world of religion, and the world of social media. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, hordes of evil spirits, and all of these images were taken by Paul from the Roman Empire. When he talked about archons, he was thinking about the Roman Empire as a whole. When he was talking about exousions, he was thinking about Roman generals, tribunes, and centurions. When he was talking about cosmocrators, he was thinking of Roman governors. And when he was talking about pneumatos ponerias, he was talking about foot, foot soldiers, which are spiritual wickedness in high places. So it's no surprise that Paul compared the armor of God to Roman battle armor. Here's a picture of a general in front of an army of soldiers. Paul was thinking about that when he talked about that verse, because the enemy has his generals and he has his captains and he has tremendous organization in the kingdom of darkness. And of course, the armor of God is compared to the Roman battle armor. Here we are. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, sword of the spirit, shield of faith. That's a big shield. Feet of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand therefore. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Here is the belt of truth. What does the belt of truth do? The belt of truth offsets the lies of the enemy. Offsets the lies of the enemy. Having been put on now the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate, here it is here, protects the vital organs. In the spiritual realm, it fends off condemnation, silencing the accuser of the brethren who loves to point out your failures. And I'm sure that all of us have dealt with that at one time or another. Oh, yeah. There we have the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. These are Roman battle shoes. Look at what they have on the bottom. They have these spikes that dug deep into the ground and kept them from being knocked over by their enemies. So verse 15 tells us, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. These shoes, the gospel, places you on the firm foundation of the word of God, which gives you stability on treacherous ground, while the world is treacherous ground. So I want to ask the question, what about the gospel gives you stability? John, what is it about the gospel that gives us stability? Uh, it, 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 it makes us aware of who we are in, in Christ. Right. What is our position in Christ? Okay, our position in Christ. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So why is it so hard to knock down a Christian who realizes who he is? Because <laughs> in order to keep his position in Christ, he does 1 John 1, 9. Which is? Where he, where he confesses his sins to his Savior, and he knows he's forgiven by the blood of Christ. Thank you so much. And Steve, why does the gospel give us such stability and makes it very difficult for the devil to knock us down? Uh, because... The gospel, when we preach the gospel, uh, it establishes everything that we have learned. Uh, it makes us rooted and grounded uh, in the love of God, because uh, this is one thing that um, we are doing the will of God and it strengthens our faith. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next piece of armor. What is it about the gospel that gives you stability? The fact that you are one with Christ, that you have a relationship with God and a salvation that can never be taken away. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. So this shield of faith blocks direct, uh, direct attacks on your confidence in God. Here's what the shield of faith looked like. Roman soldiers hiding behind their shields. Arrows came flying down and the shield would keep the arrows away. Now, what are some of the arrows that the devil throws at you? Well, can I trust God? Does he love me? Has he let me down in these terrible circumstances? 
Is he really faithful? Why is this happening to me? Maybe his promises are false. All of these are offset by faith. The faithfulness that is spoken of in the word of God. Verse 17, take up the helmet of salvation. Here's the helmet that the Roman soldiers wore. Covered a lot of the head, didn't it? It protects the head. And in this case, it protects the mind, which is the devil's primary battleground and point of attack. He will come at you through the mind, first of all. And it reminds me of the verse in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Let me just get rid of this letter here. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is right and good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. So that is the helmet of salvation. And then finally, the sword of the Spirit, which is not just the Word of God, but if you read it carefully, you'll find out that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, yes, but it's also praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit, Lee's mentioned that. And being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. It's also intercession. And for me, that utterance may be given to me and then I may open my mouth boldly. So it's also boldness. The word of God, prayer, intercession, and boldness to utter the mystery of the gospel. That's what the sword of the spirit is. Now, the sword of the spirit is symbolized by the Roman battle sword. The Roman battle sword was short. It was light. It was designed for combat at close quarters. Very interesting combat at close quarters. So that means that your battle with the enemy will be very close and very personal. Just remember that. Very close and very personal. He will attack you and show you things about yourself that you know are true to try to get you out. Roman soldiers dug their feet into the ground, pushed against you with their shields, and stuck you in the belly with their short swords, delivering a deadly blow. Let me say it again. They dug their feet into the ground, the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. They pushed against you with their shields and they stuck you in the belly with their short swords, delivering a deadly blow. Now, Lees, how can you apply this battle technique to spiritual warfare? <laughs> well, you can uh, stick them with the word of God, which is okay. the, <laughs> the sword of the spirit. Right. That That's deadly to them. Yeah. Well, first of all, they dug into the ground, right? So what does that yeah. tell me? Well, you have to dig into the word and you have to know it. Okay. Next thing they did was they pushed against the enemy with their shield. What does that tell you? The shield of faith. So they pushed against the enemy. So what was that? What does that tell you in spiritual warfare? Lees. That they will. Wow. You kind of got me on this one. Uh -huh. that, they, that they will uh, do everything in their power when you are not expecting it to knock you down. Okay. Let's go to John. John. What image do you get or what truth do you get out of pushing against the devil with the shield of faith as he comes in? What does that tell you? Turn on your mic. Uh, yeah, it's on. That, uh, that you're, you are relying on truth. Okay. That you have a reliance on truth and that, that the false things that he's trying to make you believe yeah. are false. By repeating the, tr the truth... And pressing that truth into uh, forward into him, uh, uh, you stand on, you're standing on truth. Oh, okay. I like that. Standing on the truth. What about you, Steve? When you think about pushing against the enemy with the shield and striking him with the sword, what does that tell you about spiritual warfare? Uh, the shield is to quench the fire of God to the wicked. Right. So it is to uh, stop his attack from uh, injuring me. Right. And so, shield, I stop the enemy attack and I strike with my soul with the word of God. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> okay, well, now we know how to fight. We fight with faith. <laughs> we fight with the word of God. We make sure our minds are clear of the lies of the devil. We don't allow him to condemn us because we know we're the righteousness of God in Christ and we strike him in the vital organs with the short sword. We know that we're in close combat. He's going to come after us personally and up close, and we fight him up close and personally 
supported by the body of Christ, then we can never lose the victory. That is basically the concept behind spiritual warfare. Sometimes it takes an effort. Sometimes it happens right away, but it's never easy. So on that note, I'm going to ask Lise to close in prayer. Thank you, Lise. Go ahead. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this amazing imagery and that the pastor has taken the time to dig up for us. I just ask that you would help us to understand it as we ponder it in the coming days and weeks. And you will teach us how to use it for your glory, um, that we can not only fight off the enemy, but that we can be uh, have more free time, spend less time in battle, have more free time to be able to tell others about you. And uh, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Don't forget to watch the Bible study over again as I post it tomorrow morning, because this is a Bible study we need to repeat to ourselves over and over again till we get it right, till we can fight with effectiveness. And I'll see you next week. God bless you. Bye bye. Thanks, back. Thank you. Yes. Take bless care. You. Take care. Said we. That's him. Said we. Bye bye. <laughs>